the most absorbable nanoparticle of curcumin, giving the best bioavailability, um, it's important for us to know why exactly that is the case. So I briefly want to go over some drug and uh, in Archaeus dietary supplement metabolism and just how those processes work and why um, we see poor bioavailability in certain formulations versus better in others. So now here we have um, a typical example of a dietary supplement that is consumed orally. So the route that this dietary supplement takes is that it first goes through the intestines where it does undergo some minor metabolism, but nothing um, too drastic. And then from the intestines, it enters the portal vein. And from there, the dietary supplement goes through the liver. And now in this liver, we have major metabolism occurring. The liver is responsible for breaking down all drugs and, uh, and or supplements that the body is consuming. So right here through the liver, we undergo what is known as phase one and phase two drug metabolism. Um, if you are a pharmacology student, this is what you learn in your first year of pharmacy school um, so you can better understand drugs. So going through the liver, undergoing this phase one and two metabolism, um, forming a lot of metabolites, and then from there, the active ingredient that still survives is able to go on into what is known as systemic circulation. That, and at that process, um, the ingredient is now active in your body, in your bloodstream, giving those beneficial effects. So in the case of many dietary supplements, as well as curcumin, right here at the liver, most of the ingredient is broken down via phase one and two metabolism, resulting in poor bioavailability of products. So uh, let's look a little bit deeper at what phase one and phase two metabolism um, is composed of exactly. So phase one drug metabolism has to do with what is known as the class of CYP450 enzymes. Uh, most importantly, an enzyme known as CYP3A4 which is known for having um, just about 50% uh, having to do with just about 50% of drug metabolisms in the body. So the basic function of this enzyme, what it does now is it adds an OH, what is known as a hydroxy group, or a double O, a double bonded oxygen group, in order to make the uh, metabolized drug more water soluble because the process of this what this process is doing is basically getting that, that drug metabolized and ready to be excreted by the kidneys when it is then eliminated as waste. So this process, the whole goal of this metabolizing process is to make the ingredient more water soluble to be eliminated by the kidneys. Um, a is important to note that one uh, ingredient or compound that forms from this phase one process by curcumin is what is known as tetrahydrocurcumin, which does have a little bit of benefits on its own, which we can discuss later. Um, but most of these metabolites are going to be biologically inactive, meaning that they have no real use for us. And we would like to um, minimize the amount of curcumin being metabolized into these metabolites. So now here we go to phase two drug metabolism. And the purpose here of phase two is much like phase one, where um, the body is getting the drug or product um, to become excreted by the kidneys. But here we have specific uh, transferase enzymes working. And the goal of those enzymes is to add a sulfate or glucuronate group onto the product to de detoxify the drug in order to get it more safely excreted by the kidneys. So in the case of curcumin, we have a major byproduct of curcumin by phase two drug metabolism to curcumin sulfate and curcumin glucuronide. So these two, uh, these two metabolites of curcumin are known to be biologically inactive. And this is a big reason for curcumin's poor bioavailability in the human body because so much of the curcumin that we ingest is broken down in the liver by phase two metabolism. So ideally, whenever we choose a nano encapsulating formula, what we want to do to maximize the effects of curcumin is find a way 
in order to bypass this liver metabolism by phase one and more importantly phase two drug metabolism um, to keep as much active curcumin as we can in systemic circulation. Now, one way that we do that, as I discussed previously with liposomes, micelles, and solid lipid nanoparticles, is by going through the lymphatic system. So, going through the lymphatic system, we are able to bypass this liver metabolism. So, for a drug or a supplement to be absorbed through the lymphatic system, there's a certain criteria that must be met. So, some of that criteria is that the product must be um, very fat soluble and it should also be pretty small in size so that it can be properly absorbed through the lymphatic system contrarily to what we have seen with liposomes um, some of the liposomes just being too large to be able to be taken up through the lymphatic system okay so my cells and solid lipid nanoparticles are then ideal candidates for this lymphatic absorption of, of drugs um, with solid lipid nanoparticles being active longer and also being absorbed through the blood-brain barrier they are usually the ideal candidate um, whenever it comes to solid lipid nanoparticles versus a micelle. Now um, this is what the example of lymphatic absorption looks like as compared to your typical oral consumption of a drug. So in order to get lymphatic absor absorption we still start by orally consuming um, the supplement and then the supplement still goes through the intestines but if it meets our criteria, criteria of being mostly fat soluble and small in size it can then be uptaken by the intestinal lymphatic system and then enter systemic circulation where the drug is now active so what this means is that there is no first pass effect of this product being metabolized through the liver because it doesn't go through the liver at all it merely goes through the intestines and absorbed through the lymphatic system in the intestines um, this is for something like curcumin this is very beneficial and you are able to avoid those phase one and phase two drug metabolisms that we discussed earlier um, it is imp important to note though that for some products um, it is crucial for the product to be metabolized by the liver in the case of something like a pro drug wherever the actual product you are taking is not yet active and requires liver metabolism to become active um, there are many pro drugs like this one being um, adrafinil the pro drug of modafinil you consume adrafinil which is inactive it gets broken down through the liver to convert to the active form of modafinil but in the case of curcumin this is not required as curcumin is already an active compound and we want to reduce the total amount of metabolites it makes um, and keep it active as much as possible to be in systemic circulation. I want to talk a little bit about one of the metabolites of curcumin that is a result of the phase one metabolism when curcumin uh, gets metabolized by the liver and that is tetrahydrocurcumin. Now this uh, this has been marketed in some supplements as being superior to curcumin uh, because it's a little bit more bioavailable, bioavailable compared to curcumin um, with it being three times more bioavailable than your standard curcumin. So what the difference is between tetrahydrocurcumin and ordinary curcumin is everything in the structure is the same except right here. The, in the structure of curcumin we have a double bond here as well as a double bond here so those two double bonds have been reduced in this structure thus the name tetrahydrocurcumin because those double bonds have been replaced by in essence uh, four hydrogens um, two on each side reducing this molecule into what you see here so what this does is it also makes this tetrahydrocurcumin a more of a white colored powder rather than it being the yellow yellow um, unique color of curcumin so this gives it some application in things like lotions cosmetics something that you can put on your skin that you don't want to have that sort of yellow pigment that curcumin is known for so it does have some use there 
And as well, in addition, it has a stronger antioxidant activity compared to curcumin, but it lacks those anti-inflammatory properties that curcumin has. And if you recall, in the beginning of this video, we talked about what groups in curcumin give it the antioxidant properties, being these, um, these phenoxy groups over here, as well as this methylene group. So those are still retained in the structure, so we see those antioxidant effects still in But with these reduced double bonds, we also lose the ability for this structure to bind to many of the uh, enzymes and molecules in the human body, such as DNA. Um, tetrahydrocurcumin is unable to bind to DNA now, um, giving that a, you will lose a lot of the potential beneficial effects of curcumin whenever it is unable to bind in many target sites in the human body. And for this reason, um, curcumin, tetrahydrocurcumin loses its anti-inflammatory properties as well as the ability to bind in many target tissues. So for this reason, um, tetrahydrocurcumin's use should only be limited to the application of things like cosmetics and other skin products, while curcumin and certainly a more highly bioavail bioavailable form of curcumin is going to have much more applicable use.